Okay, hello everybody. Um, <clears throat> before we come to creative capital, I would like to <clears throat> say some words on the state of the ecosystem. And um, my, uh, um, my hypothesis is that for a successful ecosystem, you need a clear identity center. So it is the Silicon Valley or it's Israel as an example. You have to have acceleration of scale because in the past we have <clears throat> tend to build organizations specific for countries and not on a higher scale. And the third one, and which is our topic afterwards, will be strong financial environment. So I think on the identity center, it is getting more and more obvious that Berlin is taking the lead here for several reasons. It's hip, it's cool. Um, you have a great, okay, you have a great um, <clears throat> comparison in terms of cost base. So um, <clears throat> that is one indicator. The other indicators are if you look how many people are going to Berlin as a fresh pool of thought and of working force, uh, you see that it is per quarter a high inflow in Berlin. And if you compare these numbers also to people from foreign countries that come to Berlin, it's also speaking a clear message of how attractive Berlin is. So <clears throat> in terms of identity center, I think we can tick box it. So in terms of acceleration of scale, I think the last years, especially with second time entrepreneurs, we have seen that people start to think more global and also build more global uh, companies. We have seen this example which became global and also we have seen that um, <clears throat> the, the, the great work that the Zamos have been doing for Groupon, yeah, we have done something similar for uh, some shopping clubs that we did internationally roll out and for the couponing model as well. So we launched <clears throat> like 20 companies in the Groupon model and in the uh, shopping club model and only in one country we managed not to be a market leader. So I think the, the scale story is also there. And the last story is probably the most interesting one because it's the most difficult to work on, which is the strong financial in environment. So <clears throat> if we look, so <clears throat> here is a, a view on how many public companies we have in the different regions. And you see that is that we are still lagging behind a little bit. It's getting more obvious if you compare the market caps. So whereas inter pure internet market caps is 640 billion in the US and 130 billion in China. If you look to, to Europe, it is only 7 billion, and most of that is mail.ru. So <clears throat> how does it, and if you get into, do, do a deep dive, then it's even getting um, more interesting. So the venture capital per capita, you see how big the difference is between Silicon Valley and Israel and Europe. So I think there is, a great deal of work we still have to do in order to make it very, uh, to, to keep up here uh, and to improve. But this is for me the most interesting slide. <clears throat> and not only the invested capital speaks a clear language, for me the most interesting number here is the median round size. Whereas the median round size um, <clears throat> in Europe is 2.94 million, so in US it's 4.75 and in, in China it's 10. What does it mean? At the end that means that the, the, the credibility that the financial investors give to small companies is way higher because they think they become bigger, and therefore they get way more money from the VCs and can have this money to also build bigger companies there. I think that is <clears throat> the biggest structural disadvantage we have. Yeah, just to give you an, uh, uh, a data point on that, so when we were building up our couponing businesses, at some point in time we had the same numbers like Living Social, meaning like 14 and a half million revenue per month and four and a half million of margin back several years. And <clears throat> whereas Living Social got a billion in valuation and 200 million in, yeah, if you are based in Europe, you get something like 200, 250 million valuation and 40 million in. I mean, if, you, if we keep on having this unfair disadvantage here and we're, don't work on the structure, it will be very difficult to overcome that and to build big companies. So <clears throat> I think on, on, on the financial side, we still have to work very hard, and so that's why I want to make the bridge to the panel that Henry is moderating. Thank you very much, Klaus. So let me just briefly reintroduce everybody so you have a good sense of how we have, who we have here. Klaus, as you know, is an incredibly successful angel investor in Europe primarily, but also in the United States. Bruce Oss is the global head of business development for NASDAQ, which is one of the world's biggest public stock markets and technology providers to other markets. Philip Price is the head of 
European media business of KKR, one of the world's most successful private equity firms. And Tim Draper is the founder and CEO of Draper Fisher Jurvetson, which is one of Silicon Valley's most legendary and successful venture capital firms. So really what we have here is the full range of capital providers to all ranges of companies and so forth. And so the first question I have for the panel is, given this incredible wealth of capital providing here, is the system perfect now? Can anybody who gets capital need it? Are we perfectly efficient, Tim? You know, I, I actually do believe, uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I do believe that uh, the closer we get to a free market system with, uh, with choice, so if you put free market system together with choice, you, you put free competition together with choice, you get the most efficient system that I can imagine or that I, I think anyone has, has come up with to date. And I think that has been, um, I think that's a really powerful thing. I think that has the ability to, um, to be the most efficient way for all of us to deploy capital and for that capital then to, uh, to go into the right hands. And so why is it the, the United States now is still, still has the best range of capital providers in the world. What's going on in the US versus here and in China and so forth? You want, you want me to keep going? Yeah, well, you can, okay, or Phil can jump in, or, <laughs> go ahead. I was actually eyeing the bed over here. Th Steffi, thank you. For the yeah. jet lag guys, you know, this is a really good thing. Um, <laughs> but we could try it out. Um, so, so, uh, Here's what I think. I think uh, the U.S. is, uh, the Silicon Valley is, has created this just incredible machine, and I got to grow up and watch it turn from apricot orchards to what it is now, this, this incredible machine of, of uh, strength and, and uh, great economy, and, and it rebuilds itself. Uh, in some ways, the U.S., is resting on the laurels of the Silicon Valley and a little bit resting on its own laurels. And so it still is the best place in the world, I think, to go start a business. But it has allowed other co countries to come up and compete with it. And uh, that competition has become even fiercer as the internet has allowed us all to, uh, to be closer together and geographic borders are falling. And, uh, and so we're all able to uh, very aggressively uh, compete, but the countries are now forced to compete for the great minds and the capital of the world. And they're seeing that. And so... Uh, and we'll talk about that in okay. more detail. So Klaus... Great. So I, I don't think it is at all about getting the money. I think the, the right financing partner and structure is the most underestimated uh, factor of correlation to success. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the, uh, just the companies where I'm a happy board member like the Stardos or the, the Spotify's and the Klanas, the impact uh, that the financing partner has on the daily business is so huge that uh, it is a very, very complicated choice for everybody to find the right partner there. So I think at the end, on the last miles to become a really big, uh, big company and very successful company, I think the correlation is 70 to 80 percent to have the right partners that give you the, the right decisions to, to steer your business. So in other words, you don't just want money from somebody. You want their expertise and their connections and their help building the business. Yes, I mean, you look what happens. There is an entrepreneur that starts a business. And normally he's young. So, and the moment he starts, he, at the beginning, he has a challenge in finance, he has a challenge in PR, he has a challenge in building an organization. So, everything he has never been through to in his life. So, it is very, very helpful if you have a, a partner that has gone through that and, and can give strategic guidance on these kind of things. So, Philip, jump in. Why is Europe behind the U.S. in this one area, in terms of angel capital, entrepreneurialism, and so forth? Talk about what you do relative to that. Well, I would say, um, before we jump into that, I totally agree with Klaus. Uh, we are living in a great age of two mega trends. One is globalization, the other one is fast-paced technological change. So, 
all of the you know aspects of life that are touched on this, whether it's people, whether it is companies, whether it is capital, have to change with it. So if we look under the hood of where the capital is coming from, also to your point, is actually radically changing. You know, while I'm representing one of the largest uh, pools of capitals, uh, you, you know, residing in the United States, if you look at who my capital sources are behind who we are, that has radically changed over the last 20 years. So you will see a much larger share of Asian or other sovereign wealth uh, pools of capital. And the second point is, you know, capital alone doesn't suffice anymore. So as Klaus says, not only small entities, but also large entities are changing radically now. This is internationalization, whether, you know, we look at a company like Dima Cranes, which we brought public a few years ago. When we bought it, it was purely German. You know, when we brought it public, it had shifted its manufacturing blueprint relatively dramatically to the Czech Republic, which is something we helped with. The other example is uh, BMG, which is a music publishing firm, which we are building with Bertelsmann, where one of the largest media companies in the world decided, you know, the capital we have, the capital we can find from many people, but we need a partner who's global, we need a partner who has the network on all of uh, those continents with the right entrepreneurs, with the right suppliers, who have 70 portfolio companies that we can link with, who might have some broadcasters because music and broadcasting works well together. So to your question, uh, Europe, you know, historically, I mean, we see it in the Euro crisis right now, is going through some of the processes the United States has gone through uh, after the Civil War where you know, the individual states had to come together and sur surmount some of the challenges of having smaller entities. I think we're seeing tremendous progress if you look at what we're seeing in Europe now. What's happening in, in Italy is fantastically encouraging. Uh, what's happening in Spain is encouraging. So I've, I do believe we'll see a step change and people like Klaus uh, are, are doing a great job helping with it. Um, you know, pan europeanizing uh, startups uh, at a rapid uh, scale. So the picture we have presented here will probably look very different in 10 years from now. So the civil war comparison, you're not saying that Europe is 150 years behind the United States? <laughs> the capital markets are. Oh, good. I, doesn't appear that way to me. So let's just bring Bruce into this. You go back to the 1990s, the IPO market was incredibly important to innovation. It was the exit. It was what so many companies were aiming for when they got funded. The last 10 years, with the exception of a few huge companies and a bunch of flops that have been tremendous disappointments, the IPO market has basically been closed in the United States. Bruce, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, if you look at the US, I think overall, the capital markets are, are broken. Um, we've overregulated ourselves to the point where the cost of going public is, is pretty prohibitive today. So NASDAQ has been very um, you know, instrumental in trying to create new forms of capital formation. We, uh, we launched last year uh, the BX Venture Market, which allows companies to create capital on a smaller basis. We, we want to really have that easy access to capital. We've also been pushing Washington to uh, not overregulate uh, public companies, and we're pushing for Sarbanes-Oxley reform so the companies below a billion in market cap would be exempt uh, of Sarbanes-Oxley. So, and so we, talk, talk about some of these costs, because I think a lot of people don't appreciate it. I mean, from what I've heard, it's, it basically costs companies four to five million dollars a year just to be public in the United States, and that is just to protect themselves from accounting firms and lawsuits and all the compliance. What else is there involved? On a price earning of 50. Right. Right. right, and I think I think all the things you just said. It's really it's, it's the accounting firms. It's the it's the it is the the legal firms. Obviously, in the U.S., we have a very litigious society, so you have to protect yourself against shareholder lawsuits. Uh, your board members want to be protected. So you know, Nasdaq works very closely. We've created a suite of services that really help companies get ready to be a public company. So whether it be for investor relations, corporate communications, corporate governance, we really try to help those companies early on. And that's why I'm here at DLD, is to really st start early with companies in their early late life cycle. Because we obviously have a vested interest in companies going public. It does create jobs, creates new innovations. So um, that's what we're all about. And give us some statistics on the IPO market this year in the United States, relative to what it was expected to be, how many companies went public. Yeah, in 2011, we had 78 companies listed on NASDAQ. Our, our target was around 150. 
Um, so we had some great companies uh, that we welcomed, like Yandex raised $1.3 billion. You had Zynga raising a billion, Groupon raising 700 million. So some very large deals that got out in 2011, but the pipeline we have for 2012 is huge. We have 112 companies that have filed to come to NASDAQ this year. Uh, Carlisle just filed uh, last week to come to NASDAQ. But we have a lot of great internet companies that are in the pipeline. We've got three deals uh, looking to go uh, this week alone. So. We just need some certainty in the markets. Uh, with this uncertainty in the capital markets, companies are not going to go out. They're going to look for alternatives, and we've seen that with a lot of M&A activity, with Skype being bought by, by Microsoft and, and, and so forth. So we want the public markets to work, and, but we do need some certainty in the markets. So if Europe comes down, I think we'll be, we'll be there. All right, so let me float a theory, and Tim, I want you to jump in here, which is that, yes, it's incredibly expensive to be public, and it's scary, and it's humiliating when you flop, and there's so many drawbacks of being public, but when I hear people talk about the problem being uncertainty or market volatility, what I really think is the problem is that in the, in the 1990s, when everybody wanted to go public, it was because the public markets were giving companies much more massive valuations than they could get in the private markets. So who wouldn't want to go public and who wouldn't as a private investor want their companies to go public to get bid up by investors who maybe didn't know quite as much as the experts who put in the money at a lower valuation. And what I see in the public market now is the public market is actually waking up and being somewhat intelligent about valuation and not just sending stocks to the stars because they sound kind of sexy and Groupon went out, everyone was so excited and 20 minutes later it crashed below the OP IPO price. So isn't part of the issue with the IPO market that the, uh, the public market investors have finally wised up and aren't just taking whatever crap you guys throw at them and bidding it up to the sky? No, I, I, I don't think really that's the case. I think, um, <laughs> I think there's a, um, there is always going to be a public market premium uh, because they have more liquidity in the public markets. Um, but I agree with Bruce, and I also want to say that, Bruce, thank you for all the lobbying you're doing to try to make it easier for us. We've had, in the venture capital business, we've had a 10-year, at least in the U.S., we've been fortunate overseas at DFJ, but, but uh, in the U.S., we've had this this uh, dearth of activity in liquidity. The companies are doing great, things are doubling every year, whatever, but they, they can't seem to get public because, um, because of maybe Sarbanes-Oxley and other regulations that have, have created this, this floor of a billion dollar market cap, really, to get a company public. So. Uh, for those companies that are worth somewhere between a hundred million and a billion that we funded when they were back, you know, worth zero, um, they have no way out. And so uh, I, I uh, helped get this company started called Expert Financial to, to fill that gap with private companies and allowing them to go public, you know, not quite public because it's, um, it's only allowed for high net worth and qualified institutions. But, um, but it, it's what used to be the, the four horsemen. It's, it's what used to allow those little companies to go out. And um, sure, there are gonna be, there's gonna be tulip mania on occasion in the public markets. Um, and I think it comes every you know, 18 years. But, uh, but I think in general, the public markets uh, view the entire capital situation and they determine what these prices are and I think they're generally fair. So what impact is it going to have on what you all do if the IPO market doesn't really start working again? Ultimately, does that hurt angel investing? Does it hurt what you do, Tim? Philip, is it good for you because all these companies are stuck and you can buy them all up at cheap prices? Well, I, I'll start because I think um, with expert financial, they can do XPOs and stay private and be tradable and raise money. So that, that kind of allows something in the middle for these entrepreneurs who, you know, they've been working really hard and they're getting pressure from their spouse to buy a house or something and they've got something of, of great value. They built something of great value, but they can't sell it. And, uh, and so this is a way to uh, raise money for their company and have tradable shares and stay private. Otherwise, they have to sell out and they don't necessarily want to because their vision doesn't get fulfilled. That's I, think, I, 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 sorry, I think it is even worse for Europe. I mean, if you look at the financing landscape, 
all the VCs have their portfolio loaded with companies. And if these companies, I mean, let's face it, the US companies can only buy some of the, the, com the, the portfolio companies of the VCs. So if the VCs can't clear their portfolios through IPOs or other ways of selling companies, so they don't recycle the money, so they won't get fresh money, and then the whole system will be combusted, and, and I think will have huge, uh, huge effects on the whole ecosystem. But I think that's, you know, fundamentally goes back to my point that the capital markets are, are basically broken in the U.S. We need to find ways to fix it. I think XP, experts done some innovative things. We've got other markets like Second Market that are looking for new ways to raise capital. It just tells you there's, there's something that's not there today. Uh, but at the same time, that's not just one thing that's affecting the capital markets today. It's You have to look at the fact that the markets are down. There's the huge equity outflows in the fourth quarter of last year. There's just... The, the, the amount of institutional investment money that is available for these deals is limited, and they have the opportunity to actually pick and choose the, the companies they want to invest in. I think that's what we're seeing today. But you have to kind of really stick with the fact that we had volatility, tremendous volatility in the markets in 2011. We got big deals out, so it's not like it's totally broken. I mean, I, I will take the uh, the Warren Buffett line, which is uh, maybe an alternative perspective on this. It's a great opportunity. I would say, you know, everybody who calls the, you know, IPO markets dead will be surprised when we will see that at some point the euro crisis will be addressed and we see confidence and optimism go back in the capital markets. In the end, it's all interlinked, right? It's the central nervous system of the global economy. If there's a crisis of confidence, capital doesn't flow, IPOs don't get done. Uh, for players like us, which are you know, big pools of private capital, but also entrepreneurial capital, which come with more than just, you know, an IPO, it's a great opportunity if the system doesn't allow IPOs, because if we have sizable enough companies, we might help out with this, buy them. And also some of the companies we own, whether it's Nielsen or ProSieben or Seven in Australia, uh, might be interested in buying some of these companies. And, uh, you know, uh, that's an alternative. So it's an opportunity. But I would say, let's all be optimistic. We're living at a great age. Um, globalization and technological innovation is creating all these opportunities. Of, co of course, we will hit some bumps on the road, yeah? Uh, and as long as people are concerned that we will have domino effects of global banking defaults, people will not be amenable to financing IPOs. So it's really a global challenge that has to be addressed before we will see confidence come back in the market sale. So if you step back and you look at the capital markets over the last 20 to 30 years, in fact, the public markets are relatively reasonably priced. In fact, you could argue that they're maybe 20% above where they should be on a long-term earnings basis. But part of the problem is, we all got so spoiled in the 1990s where markets just went up, 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 up every time. A little dip was a buying opportunity. When you all talk about lack of confidence in the markets and volatility, aren't you really saying we just need to get back to that point where stocks only go up? I mean, look at uh, Warren Buffett. He just bought a big stick in Tesco in the UK, which has one profit warning after the other because, and people think the UK is really structurally challenged, earnings are coming down, consumers don't have any cash. He's saying nay. You no, know, it's trading at a 20-year earnings low, and it's a fantastic opportunity for me to accumulate a stock because I'm not investing on a quarterly basis. I'm investing on a five- or 10-year horizon. The problem is the myopic view of some investors who need to perform on a quarterly or half-yearly basis, and that's killing them because these short-term trends can move against you. Yeah. Yeah, the markets aren't rational right now. I think you, you can't say they're rational. And I think what's happening in Europe uh, and, and that overhang on the markets is, is, is really affecting you know, what we're seeing today. So I don't think we're in a normal period. We do hope we get back to some sense of normalcy and certainty. We're in an election year in the US. Nothing really happens in an election year. So we, we, we do hope that things will get back to normal. State. Okay, so let's talk about valuation. So eight months ago in the United States, 50 times a day, you heard, oh, it's just a bubble again. These idiot venture capitalists, Silicon Valley, paying these absurd prices. Groupon, obviously a fraud. It's worth zero, and yet they're paying $10 billion. Nobody says that anymore. Groupon went public. It's nicely valued. It's going to be fine, I think, as a company. A lot of these companies that everyone laughed at are doing fine. Tim, are we in a bubble, though? Well, I think as, as long as people are still asking that question, I don't think we're anywhere near it. Um, I, think, uh, I think actually there's sort of an interesting uh, pattern that I've noticed, and I'm not sure it's going to continue, but uh, it's worked for two generations, and that is 
Um, and, it, and it works with Philip and I sort of being on a seesaw. This, is, this would be like a seesaw. Um, where everyone's out of work and then the, a couple of people start businesses and they grow and they start employing people and more venture capital goes out and, and they grow and they get bigger and bigger and then there's more interest in venture capital and it goes and goes and goes and then there's a frenzy of activity and then there's a bubble and then it pops and it crashes down and then these guys come in, they make it all much more efficient uh, and they, they leverage these business up and they, they get, the, get the financing down to, assist, to a science and then it, uh, employment goes, goes flat for a while and, the, um, and then the banks loan crazy, crazy prices and then they, they start giving away money to these guys and then it comes up in another bubble and it comes crashing down. Then we have a recession, people are out of work and then they start new businesses again, and then uh, we have another cycle. And it seems to have worked um, for the last 40 or 50 years. So how long and are the cycles in venture capital, and where are we in the current cycle? Well, I think they've just had their crash, and, the, um, and so the, uh, the, we had the recession, we had people out of work, they all started new businesses, and the angels just started to pick it up. And so I think that we're, you know, the next stage will be like the Series A, Series B, and then we'll go into the Series C, and then people will start going public again, or maybe XPOs, and then they'll get into this frenzy, and then the individual investor will come in, and there'll be this crazy activity, and it'll be like tulip mania again, and then we all better sell. But that's a, <laughs> a, a very famous venture capitalist in the speaker ready room just advanced a theory to me that it's a nine-year cycle, and we are in year three. Would you we agree are. with that, venture capitalist? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think we had a little discussion beforehand. Yeah, but I anyway, think this yeah, discussion I think is we're in year three of that nine-year cycle because, uh, and and so we've got another great six great years. It's you know for venture capitalists, it's our time, baby. <laughs> but I think this discussion is a little bit too much from the point of view of U.S. I think there are a lot of merits of having a stronger. Um, IPO ecosystem here in Europe because in Europe shares are about ownership in the US it's a currency and if you have high-valued uh, internet companies in the US they can pay with their shares and so they make an agglomeration of, 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 of companies yeah because if we don't do that at the end and we see that it is happening we are exporting the internet economy to the US so all things we build up are sooner or later picked up by U.S. companies because they can pay in shares. And at the end, everything is done out of the U.S. and we have no big companies that, that decide the ecosystem, that drive the ecosystem here. And therefore, I think it is very necessary that in terms of having a long-term perspective and keeping the industry here, we have to have a solid, um, so solid uh, market for listed companies in Europe. I agree with you. We own the the, the, uh, the Nordic Stock Exchanges, so uh, a lot of great innovation comes out of you know Copenhagen, Stockholm, um, and we've seen some great companies like Spotify that have, that have come from those markets. But uh, fundamentally, Europe still can't get IPOs out. So we do see it where we're seeing internet companies from Europe now are calling me saying where they wouldn't have gone to U.S. to deal with Sarbanes-Oxley and and the overregulation. They are coming now because they can get the valuations they want in Europe. So uh, until Europe gets back on his feet, I think you're going to still have that problem. So last, last series of questions, we're running out of time, is the role of government and what the perfect regulation is. After the crash of the 1990s, the government and the people in the United States and in Europe decided, your job is to protect us from losing money on stupid IPOs. So we erected Sarbanes-Oxley, all these rules that are now crippling our markets, and the same thing in Europe. On the other hand, when it's complete free-for-all and everybody is encouraged to buy every IPO, that's when people who should never, ever, ever consider buying an internet IPO do get burned. So what is the right level of regulation and how close are we to it? Well, I'd, I'd argue that, uh, that less regulation is better uh, in general, uh, but I, I do believe that uh, the governments have to um, have to start to compete in this way, and I think we will start taking our companies out in the places that the 
the governments are the most friendly to, uh, to business. And uh, I've had interesting experiences there where I was in Ukraine and they said, you must invest in Ukraine. And uh, President Yushchenko said, you must invest in Ukraine. And I said, I'm never gonna invest in Ukraine. What are you thinking? And he said, he said why not? And I said, well, because it takes six months and, and uh, 23 bureaucrats before I can even start a business here. And he said, that will be one bureaucrat, one week. Um, now, it didn't really happen, but, um, but at least he had the message, and it was a strong message that we are going to compete for you guys. We're going to try to be out there for entrepreneurs and for, uh, for new businesses, and I, I think that's going to work. I, I don't know what the right level of regulation is. I just know that we've got too much now. I would totally agree with that. I would say that you know regulators around the world are very open because they, it's all about jobs. Wherever you are, Europe, U.S., it's all about jobs and venture capital. Uh, the new entrepreneurs in this room, you know, create jobs, and so they are listening to us and they do want to find ways to to stop the regulation. Again, election year probably not getting a lot done, but in 2013 we're hopeful. Great, we're out of time. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you.